Services at Across, I think people went to uh, Ben's talk earlier on modules. Okay, awesome. All right, forget all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then I'm going to go over it. Then basically, I'm just going to build a project uh, in front of you guys. So, um, these are the containers that uh, I'm going to be working with, and then we're going to say goodbye. Okay, so about myself. So, you may have heard of this company uh, called Galvanize. Um, and yes, I do work for Galvanize, um, former lead instructor, and then on the uh, engineering team. And let me just double check that I'm on the engineering team. Ah, yes, there I am. That is me. So, um, besides that, I'm also uh, co founder of Python. Real Python is this a Python training program. Ah, there's one, one person knows what that is. All right, cool. So, yeah, it's just, a Pyth it's just Python web development. Um, other than that, I enjoy listening to radio and chilling and uh, doing some doing some uh, financial modeling. Pete, do you want to uh, you want to hop up and introduce yourself? You want me to do it? Uh, my name is yeah. Jeffries. Uh, I work at a company called Flowhub. Uh, Mike and I, Michael is my instructor at Galvanize a few years back. Uh, ever since he's been rubbing me in for this. Uh, and yeah, like I said, if anybody is coding along, is anybody coding along? Okay, uh, I've done the tutorial a couple times, so um, I've done a couple of those gotchas, but I think it's maybe not. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. Yes, Pete, uh, former student, he was in G11, for those that are familiar with the Galvanize uh, numbering system. Which, I don't know, I don't know if that actually started at zero or one. Zero. It did start at zero? Okay, makes sense. The world may never know. <laughs> All right, so, objective. So, by the end of this talk, um, you should be able to run a uh, fleet of microservices uh, locally. We're going to be looking at um, a number of different things associated with uh, Docker. So we're looking at, um, we're going to be using volumes. I'm also going to show how to run tests uh, that are isolated in a container, as well as using an indent test suite test cafe to test the um, entire um, Entire, entire fleet of services. Uh, we're going to look at, we're also going to be looking at job based authentication, um, getting React to play nice inside a Docker container um, 
is difficult, and it seems like it gets even more difficult every version of every new version of Create React app. Um, then we're also going to be looking at Swagger. So some of this is time permitting. I realize I only have an hour. I have done this talk a couple of times before, and um, I think it was like 45 minutes, 50 minutes before. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. So um, architecture. So basically, we're going to be taking all of the services that were in that original image here, and we are going to be containerizing them. So on the website, we have React, uh, React Router. Um, then we have a Movies API, Movies Database, um, Swagger, Users API, Users DB, and then, then Tests. Um, the, the service here, um, these are just, just kind of isolated um, within the, let me open up the repo here. So this is the project repo here. Um, if you click services, so basically the services, that, so the services section here just indicates the directory that it's in. Um, these are all going to be in different containers, except the end in test. Test cafe is a little tricky to get, um, get getting to work right inside a container, so I just left it out. Okay, so basically with microservices, um, so basically in general they're organized around domain. Um, they, it's nice if they're stateless, so you can bring them down and bring them back up. Um, I am containerizing the database. You probably wouldn't want to do that if, uh, for a production app. Um, and you can use um, various technologies. Um, so if you do, uh, one of the benefits of having microservices is people can bring their own tools, technologies, and languages, and they're really um, just concerned, all they're concerned with is that API contract. Um, kind of going a little bit deeper uh, in microservices. Microservices, like, I think that they're really good for junior developers. Uh, it de decreases the, um, the code size, much easier to, to read. So instead of uh, you know, diving into like a gigantic Django or Rails app, you just have like a single API there. It also, it also like enforces solid API design because you're most likely going to be communicating um, between services with REST. Uh, that being said, you do have to have like a really, really strong like DevOps person because with microservices, it takes the complexity out of the app and then it moves it to the actual architecture, which um, you know, opens up a, a wealth uh, or a number of problems. So um, yes, they are pretty difficult to implement. Um, all right, so that was like kind of like my opening spiel. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. It's like 2004 to 2004, 20, I believe. So now we're going to galvanize too. Let's see. So I'm on art artwork guest. I just got the password, so I um, I believe it's 2004 or 2000. Maybe it's 2014. Did you get it to work? No. Okay. So, All right. so try 2014, 2014, 20. If you have Comcast, the Xfinity one actually works here. I know that's surprising. Actually works pretty well. Yeah. Did that work? Yes. Is there any way I can view my password? Like after I put it in, other than going to the keychain, because no. I don't have I don't have my keychain set up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Try 2014, 2014, 20. If that doesn't work, try uh, 2004, 2004, 20. It's the second one. All right. So 2004, 2004, 20. And that was artwork guest. Okay. Okay. So project setup. So. Um, you want to get clone this uh, repository now, and let's just take a quick look at it. Uh, I don't know, can you, can you see that at all? Is it kind of pixelated? It's good. It's good. Back. Good. Sweet. Okay, so um, like I was saying. Um, 
you can ignore this doc section, that's for like the uh, slides. Um, but basically, um, you know, each individual service is broken up into a folder. You can also structure this um, with separate um, GitHub repos as well. Um, the microservice stack it does introduce um, a little bit more complexity and headache to get them to communicate with each other. Um, it's a lot easier to start with just um, breaking them apart into individual folders. Um, so uh, these are all just Node Express apps, and let me actually show you what we are making. Um, basically, this is just doing you know, it's just connecting to the own DB API, and you can search for your favorite movies. And my favorite movie is Titanic 2, obviously, so I didn't even know that was a thing, but now we do. You guys are better off for that. I should have put that as an objective for the talk. Anyways, um, that's crazy. Uh, going back, so, um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, so I have my movies, um, and the movies database is buried inside the movies folder. I also have my Swagger documentation in here. You could move Swagger outside, like maybe you're using one central like version of Swagger for all, your entire API. Um, I do have tests here. Um, again, users set up the same, just a basic Node Express app. And um, for my web portion, using uh, Create React app, uh, for those that are unfamiliar with Create React app, it just like gives you a nice same boilerplate um, right out of the box. You don't have to mess with any sort of configuration with uh, Webpack or Babel. And uh, my tests are you know, obviously located in the test directory, and I just wrote like just a quick test. I did test this out this morning. The tests are breaking, so if we do get to get uh, to the actual testing, I'm going to do some debugging. So yeah, that'll be fun. Okay. <laughs> All right, so going back. Um, so, how many people have heard of Docker Compose? Cool. All right, so for those that are familiar, it's just like a uh, sort of registration tool. It just gets um, multiple containers to communicate um, together. It also it allows you in um, if you're using Docker Compose, which is just a part of the Docker tool or Docker suite of tools. It, uh, it's, it's great for running your app locally. So if you're used to like running your app with a single command, like um, you know, Rails, whatever, or Django, whatever, um, or you know, Node, whatever, um, you can do the same thing with Docker Compose. So instead of opening up like 10 different tabs, each tab representing a different service, this gives you a central way of running your app. So it's kind of like you have a monolith, but it's spread out. Uh, I do have, for those unfamiliar with Docker, I do have a Docker workshop that I put together, so there is a link there to that, and I will post the link to the slide somewhere. Not sure where yet, but it'll go somewhere. Okay, so um, with that, um, with the basic overview over, I'm going to start diving into um, bringing these containers up. So my user's DB is powered by Postgres. So the basic steps to get this going, um, I'm going to open up terminal here. That's not readable. That's not readable either. Um, okay. I guess we'll just make do with that. So, um, let's take a look at the Docker file really quick. Uh, so the Docker file is just like list a set of instructions to build a Docker image. Uh, so basically, I'm pulling from the um, already built Postgres image, and then I'm extending on top of that. And so I'm, all I'm doing here is adding a create.sql file into this entry point um, directory. So this anytime, so basically, when the container gets fired up, this uh, any SQL files that you add to this directory will uh, run, so they just run on an init. So if, you go, if I go back and take a look at the DB here, I create that SQL file, so this is just creating a database. You can maybe just create some roles here too if you wanted to. So this, again, this file is going to run on, um, on an init. And if you look at the Docker Compose file, so this again is like, um, orchestrating or connecting multiple uh, services or containers together. So under, um, excuse me. So under the uh, user's DB, I have a container name. 
also specifying the build directory. So this is the directory for the Docker file. Yeah, hi. Uh, for the Docker file, um, specifying some ports. So the port, this is exposing port 5432 within. Sorry, I'm kind of bouncing here. Um, I'll try and be a little more steady. So um, port 5432 is getting exposed inside the container, and then port 5433 uh, three, is, that three, three is getting exposed on the host. So the host is this your machine, or if it's in the cloud, it's the EC2 instance, whatever it is. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about what, why I chose 5432, 5433 after I spin this up, then setting some environment variables, and then setting a exit code here. I'll talk a little bit about the exit code in a second. So to spin this up, I can just run docker compose uh, up dash D and then build. So the dash D flag is for running this in a detached state. Um, a detached state is a little bit different than a daemon. I'm not 100, I, don't, I actually don't know the difference, um, but a lot of tutorials you'll see will call it a daemon, but it's actually not a daemon, it's a detached state. Um, and then the other flag, what was the other flag? Oh yeah, that, the uh, build flag. So that will rebuild the image. So if you haven't built the image, uh, or if you've built the image previously, this will um, rebuild it. Um, so, what did I run there? Oh, I did close up dash D. Um, so actually, I wanted to specify the service there. So the service is actually users DB. So by running, can you guys read that at all? Kind of, yeah. Do I need to move it around at all? You can move it around a little bit. It's kind of hard. Um, so yeah, this command will spin up all the services in my Docker Compose file. If you want to spin up just one, you can run, you can put the name of the service there. So you can see there's two steps. Those steps map back to the Docker file. Um, the first one is pulling Postgres, so this is pulling Postgres from Docker Hub, which is just a Docker registry. Um, registry is akin to, like, it's like GitHub for um, Docker images. And then it's adding my create.sql file. So this is up, it's running in a different universe on my computer, a different, uh, completely different operating system. So to get a quick sanity check on that, I can run it, I can hop into the, to bash. Um, so to do that, let me just make this big, so actually I can type, Docker Compose run, and then the name of the service, and then bash. So now I am inside that container, I can do an ls, you can see um, there's that directory that I was talking about, so now if I cd into the directory, um, there's my create.sql file, and you can see that it's just the same exact code. So that's up and running. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second. Are pe people are still following along. People are some people coding still. No, no. Pete, you're off the hook. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Moving on. You can raise your hand. Have Pete come over for any any other questions if you want. So yeah, he's he is the support person here. So if you tackling some weird problem at work and like you don't feel like stack overflowing, peak overflow it. Okay. Um, was like, that wasn't too bad, was it? All right. Um, all right, so for the user's uh, API, um, basically just I have my source directory here. Let's take a look at the Docker file. So this is extending from node. Um, then I'm setting a working directory. So for that working directory, like when I go into bash, this is just going to be the default directory so I don't have the CD and the user and CD and the source. I'm then putting the node modules on the path. Um, I'm then adding the package.json, doing an npm install, and then finally I'm doing an npm start. So one question that might be, pop, might be coming to mind is like, when you copy over the files and folders, and if you did ask that question, I'd say, good question. So I will talk about that in a second on why I'm actually not um, copying over um, my files and fol folders in this Docker file. And if I head back out to the um, 
Docker uh, Compose file here. So same sort of thing, like I'm saying with the tater name, the build is the you know, directory that sets the uh, context for um, the Docker engine, for, the, for where the Docker engine is gonna look for the Docker file. Um, and then um, setting some volumes, I'll talk about that in just a second. Same thing with ports, exposing uh, 3,000 inside the container, uh, 3,000 on the host. Uh, setting some environment variables. I got this depends on thing. Whoa, that's weird. Let's see what that is. Um, so basically, since the user service is dependent on the user's DB, we want to have the user service wait until the user's DB is spun up. Why do we want it to wait? Because uh, if I run the migrations and the container is not up or there is a problem with Postgres, I will get an error. So basically, the user service is not only going to wait for the user's DB container to be spun up, it's also going to, um, it, this has to send an exit code, it has to send an exit code of zero, so no errors basically. So um, uh, links, links are for connecting two containers together. So I need to reference a URI inside my user service for Postgres. And this is going to allow those containers to talk to each other. Um, I am using Docker Compose version 2.1. This version loosely relates to the actual Docker Compose tool. So if I do docker-compose-v, uh, this is using 1.1. One four. So there's only a certain amount of oh, higher. So I mean, so there are only certain versions of the Docker Compose file that you can use with this version of the CLI. Super confusing, way confusing. But um, yeah, I'm using 2.1 or 2.1. I get this health check here as well as links. So links are used again to connect containers together. Um, you want to be very careful with this because this will expose environment variables from one container to the other one. So it's actually kind of frowned upon. This is just development mode right here, so I would not do this in production. Just uh, FYI there. Um, again, and all these, this talk is mostly for development mode only. Like there's certain things in here that you do not want to do in production. And if you want to know, know what those are, you will have to pay me money. Yeah, Lots of money. No. Uh, I do have like a separate blog post that talks a little bit more about production. Okay, so um, after we spin up the container, which um, I already did, but let's just do it again for the demo. Um, so these, these steps here, again, relate back to the Docker file. Um, I then can run my migrations. And so you can see, already see that um, the dependency there. So each time I run a command, docker compose, and reference the user service, it's going to make sure the user DB is set up first and running. Um, then I can run the C command. And I have some tests here. So my user service is, uh, as the name suggests, it's just for authentication. It's job-based authentication. And if I do Docker Compose run user service and PM test, this is going to run all my tests. And hopefully they pass. Sweet goodness. All right. OK, so question? Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to cover it later, that's fine. But what is? The connects that is yeah. okay. uh, So the question was, what is connects? Connects is just an ORM that for Node, mm -hmm. um, just so JavaScript can communicate with uh, Postgres. Uh, let's see, I lost my train of thought for a second. Uh, all right, so one thing I wanted to show you was the actual uh, connects file. So this is the configuration file that I'm using um, to. Am I in the right service here? I am not. Uh, it's going to be the same sort of thing though. So. Um, the connects file here is like, this is how I'm setting up my configuration for my database. This takes a database URI that's getting passed in as an environment variable. If you go back to my Docker Compose file, um, you can 
can see that I am setting that environment variable here. One thing you see here, instead of uh, a URL, I have this the, just the URI here. This is referencing the container. That's the actual container name. If you go back to the links, if I took out this links here, that would break now because um, I'm, not, I'm not linking them together. So it does not have access to user DB at that point. So um, if you do need to use um, the database, like if, anytime that you're setting up this relationship between a you know, server and a database, you need to connect them together like this. Um, okay, moving on. All right, so uh, movies DB. I'm not going to go like over this just because it's, it's pretty much the same thing um, as the users DB. Um, so I'm just going to spin it up. Okay, so getting into a little bit more fun here. Um, I have the uh, movies API. So if we take a look at um, the code. If I go into the source directory, um, my routes, movies, you can see here that I just have some basic like uh, RESTful like routes here. Um, so I have a sanity check I just for, for ping here. Um, then I have a users endpoint and then a, uh, or I'm sorry, this is, this is for getting users um, that have, this is for like getting the movies associated with the user and this is for adding a movie. So if we take a look at this uh, middleware function here, this um, ensure authenticated, real quick, that is inside here. So you can see here inside the ensure authenticated, I am making an AJAX request from my movie service to the user service, sending in some sort of information. In this case, um, I'm adding the um, header here uh, for the bearer token, or I'm actually going to, oh, sorry, it's right here. Uh, sending in that uh, bearer token, and so then, I, again, I am referencing the user service here. So this is not actually going, if you did like say local host here, that would actually be the local host of the container. So you actually have to say user service here. When I was first starting to work with Docker, this confused the hell out of me. But um, yeah, you don't want to reference local host. So the question was like, what is Link doing behind the scenes? And my answer is, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea what Link's doing. Um, something at the network layer. Um, but yeah, I, honestly, I don't know. Okay, but that's what like, you can refer to the, the machines. Yeah. But Pete, if you want to uh, grab that one, you can. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> yes, I love it. All right. Um, sorry, I don't like how I just. That's just something I always do. I just put in links, and then it just like magically works. It, there's something with that networking level that is like loud and communicate. Um, okay. So after, let me just spin this up real quick. Uh, I'm not going to run these since I've already ran them, um, but I just want to show you that this is actually working, so I do get pawn there. So um, I briefly went over the, the route there, but uh, if I go back to my routes, you can see that I have ping there and it's sending back pawn, and that's exactly what I'm getting there. Cool. All right. So um, moving on. So the web service. All right. So we have how many containers do we have up now? Two? Four? One hundred? Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere between, let's see, how many do we actually have? We have four, yeah. So we have our user DB, user API, movies DB, and movie service. So now we want to get the web service so we can actually look at something super pretty like that. All right, going back. All right, so um, basically for uh, the React app here, using uh, create react app again um, so it's just componentized um, I could I could do a code review of each one of these but probably not gonna have time for that so 
Uh, we're just going to skim through that. Uh, if you take a look at the Docker file, and I'm going to close some of these to clear the stage a bit since it's messy. So let's do that again. Okay, so the Docker file is extending from Node again, um, setting uh, a working directory, uh, adding Node modules to the, to the uh, path, and then adding. Um, so then I'm adding my package.json, doing npm install, installing uh, React scripts so that way I can use um, uh, the CLI to uh, work with uh, React, and then doing an npm start. If I go back to my Docker Compose file here, uh, let me take a look at my web portion. So again, container name, web service, build is setting the build context. That's where my Docker file is. I do then have some volumes. Did I talk about volumes before? I can't remember. No. No? All right. Let me go back to volumes really quick. So in development, actually, who attended the uh, Docker talk? Like, contain yourself? Cool. A few people? Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, in development mode, you always, always, always want to use volumes. So basically, um, if you go back, uh, let me go back real quick and reference a <coughs> Docker file. So services, users. My Docker file there. So um, again, yeah, again, like I'm not copying over my files and folders here. Instead, I'm taking advantage of volumes. So if I go back to my root here, open up the Docker Compose file. Uh, for the user service, I'm setting a volume here. Um, on, on the left side is my local system here, and on the right side of the colon is inside of the container. So basically, I am mapping files and folders and code inside the container, or in, on my local um, directory into the container. So this allows me to make code changes locally, which will then be um, put into the container. So this allows you to do like live reloading without having to rebuild the image. If you do not use a volume and you copy over your files and folders, anytime you make code changes, you need to rebuild the image. And so that'll just increase the amount of time it you know, takes for you to get feedback. Uh, so definitely use this, uh, use volumes in um, development. So he was saying this user source app, like this directory was already created for you, and I don't need to do this step here. No, just uh, um. uh, either way, I guess it doesn't matter. But yeah. uh, interesting. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, volumes. If you want to take advantage of live reload, uh, making code changes, and um, without having to rebuild your image, definitely use volumes. So. If we take a look at the, uh, the web service here, um, let me just spin this up really quick. And while it's building, let's go back to the Docker file. If anyone is actually building these on the fly right now, it is going to take a lot longer because you're or the first time you run these, you're going to have to download all the dependencies. Docker uses caching. You can see here, like, um, in the commands here, when it uses cache, it just says using cache. So that's why these are actually spinning up so fast. It's also important to take that into account when you're creating your Docker file. Like, the order matters there. And if you start screwing with the order of the Docker file, you might make changes to your code, and then it has to rebuild the image um, each time. Or actually, um, if, I, if you look at this Docker file, since I am actually adding my package.json in a different step, if I make a code change, it's not going to re-download all my dependencies. Um, and this is also important too, because if you do rebuild this image and it, wants, and it thinks that you did make a change to package.json, then it's going to re-download all the dependencies. 
So um, in the blog post, I referenced a different blog post that goes into great detail about the Docker caching system and how that works specifically with node dependencies. Yeah. So you're adding package.json to user source app, and then I saw in your volumes you had, uh, you mounted something to user source app, and you also had package.json mounted as a volume? Oh yeah, that, I actually, um, I meant to take that out of the code. If you're curious, a little more curious, if you're curious about that, then we can talk about it um, after. I didn't realize you could mount files. Yeah. Uh, he was asking why, why I'm creating a volume here for package.json. I had meant to take that out for this talk. So if you are curious, ask Pete or uh, talk to me afterwards. Okay, cool. All right, so that's up. So if we take a look at the sanity check real quick, boom. So let's see if I can log in. Went wrong. Let's see if I can register. Oh, yeah. So there we go. So now I'm logged in. We can log out. And then I can log in again. So this is kind of a janky uh, React app. Obviously, storing a little too much state here with these things. But uh, for demo purposes, I think it gets the uh, job done. Let's see if this works. Um, favorite movie. Favorite movie. Give me something. Huh? Huh? Godfather. Yes. All right. There we go, got another part two, part three, yay, cool. Um, all right, you guys curious how that Ajax request is working to OMDB API? I can go over that. Yes. No, yes, maybe? Just me. Just you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone shut your eyes. All right, let's see. Oh man, components. All right, where the hell am I making this Ajax request? App.jsx, probably. Okay, so yeah, I'm taking an API URL here. Um, that goes back up to here. Um, so with Create React App, you have, your, you have a build process, basically. And so when you do your build, it's taking all this and basically creating like static HTML or static files. So if you go back to the Docker Compose file, these environment variables are at the build time. Actually, let me rephrase that. This, this is getting injected into the image. Um, and so wherever you store this image, somebody has access to this. So if, so if you, let me rephrase that again. So let's say you create this image and push it up to Docker Hub. Docker Hub is a registry. Whatever environment variables you're adding to that image, people can access. So, there are, so you want to keep that in mind before you push any images up to Docker Hub. If you have like API keys and um, security tech credentials in there, you do not want to actually push that to Docker Hub. You want to handle your environment variables um, at a different time. Um, so going back to my app.jsx, so yeah, I mean, this is just doing, Axios is like a helper for uh, making Ajax requests, um, and so that's where I'm fast getting the URL. Um, let's see, okay. So, um, five containers up right now. Um, the last container I'm gonna spin up, I'll spin that up in a second, is for Swagger. Uh, let's pause for just a second. I know this was a lot. So, uh, any questions thus far? I feel like I'm just like throwing up all over you guys. That, that's a metaphor. That is a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, one question I just on the React part of it. Why Axios is supposed to fetch? Um, no reason. Okay. Yeah. So this is a stupid question. But, uh, the Postgres is storing its uh, database files in the container. Is it worth creating volume on the local so Postgres writes it to a local file system? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question is about Postgres and where it's like actually storing the data. You probably do want to create a volume for that, so that way it is on your local file system. Um, yeah, and then you'd want to definitely handle that differently in production using RDS or something. Uh, just another product question really quick. So obviously, environment variables are going to be in your Docker file. Can you create another one you don't put on a Docker hub to set that up, or do you usually go in after, before things are building and set those on the production server? Like, how does that actually work? Yeah, that's a really good question. So environment variables and 
microservices and Docker is like a really hot topic right now about all right, how do you share like um, environment variables and secrets across 100 containers, for example, or like what happens like when you offboard an employee, like how do you revoke credentials? And there is not really a solid like solution to that right now. Um, one thing that's kind of uh, hot right now is Vault and Console, which is kind of like introduces a global um, environment store, and then you can just basically inject your environment variables at the um, uh, when you're actually running the container. What was it called? Vault. Yeah. It's a hashing thing. Good questions. Any other questions? All right. So. Uh, I'm going to go over workload for just a second. So I'm going to show logs, and then I'm going to show how the live reload works. So for logs, um, pretty basic. You can just say Docker compose logs dash f. You can also, if you want a specific uh, service, you can put that there as well. So you can see here um, all the, all the um, logs here. Docker by default um, sends everything to standard out. So you can see the different um, logs for the services here. Um, you probably want to pipe this to some sort of like uh, logging management system like Sentry or you know, one of those other uh, SaaS providers. Uh, all right, so live reload. So if we take a look at my tests, um, so I have unit and integration tests. Uh, let's see, let's screw up one of these. Uh, let's actually do the integration test. So if I take a look at users here, um, let's change this. Let's take one of the C's out here, and you already, I don't know if you saw that, but it actually, I wasn't going to show this, but it actually did the live reload there, so if I undo that, save it, you can see like, it's like super difficult to read, I know, but the point is that it is updating. Um, so if I go back and I make, make that change again, success, um, and now if I go back and I run my tests, so, so my history here somewhere, right? That was the user service. My test should fail now. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, ah, yay, okay, we got a failure, that's what we want, cool. So it's saying, ah, okay, ah, who spelled that wrong? Hey, that was me. Okay, let me fix that. So again, if you did not have volume set up, you would actually have to rebuild you would have to rebuild the image um, before running the test. So definitely, definitely set up volumes. Um, okay, uh, live reload with React is awful um, with Docker containers. This version of Create React App, it actually works. If you do it, use a different version with different um, version, like diff different React versions, I have had a nightmare time trying to get it set up. So, um, I recommend just not depending on Live Reload for um, Create React App. I can show you working here real quick. Um, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Let's, um, let's set the default to um, Godfather. Godfather. Okay. Maybe that will rebuild. Let's see what happens. So it works, but nine times out of 10, that doesn't work, or you have to screw with it um, to get it to work. Uh, also with React, I am not actually creating my build, so that I am running the development server. So this is running the development server within the container. Uh, okay, so going back. All right, end to end tests. So end to end tests are actually broke right now, as I was saying. So we might be able to debug this together. Yay, okay, live, live, live debugging, and yeah, right. Um, all right, <laughs> maybe we'll go back to it. Let's take a look at Swagger. You wanna, actually, actually, you guys wanna debug it, or you wanna go over Swagger? Swagger. Swagger, Swagger? all right, yeah, solid, solid, all right. We'll make Pete do it later. Or now. Uh, Okay, so Swagger. So if you take a look at the Swagger file, does everyone know what Swagger is? Uh -huh. API documentation. Um, 
So this takes a swagger.yaml file. This just like you would want to actually, you know, this is just a sample, but you know, you want to create actual real documentation for your API. Um, all my Docker file is doing is the same sort of thing. So it's just um, you know, adding dependencies, doing npm install, running npm start. We take a look at the package.json, npm start is just running node, index.js. We take a look at index.js. This is just pulling in, um, uh, let's see what am I doing here. So I'm just pulling in HTTP and I'm using, just creating a separate ser uh, server there. Okay, so um, we can spin this up now. And if we look at the Docker Compose file just really quick, take a look at Swagger, we have a container name, I'm setting some volumes. Same thing with the ports here. Um, this is dependent on the user service and the movie service. So this is, again, going to wait for them to be up and send an exit code of zero before it, it uh, tries to fire itself up. So then if we go to localhost 3003 support slash docs, yeah, we have our Swagger docs. I can take a look at this, and this is actually, um, Swagger allows you to um, actually try out the API that you have documented. So this is just going to hit the ping route, and there's my um, request URL, and there is Pong. So, boom, it's working. Um, all right, we, I'm gonna skip the bugging of tests, like that could be a rabbit hole. So that's all I have. Um, we've got a question in just a second, but, um, some next steps, like if you wanted to like put this in production, um, there's like a thousand different steps here, but <laughs> that you really need to do for that. But you know, you can add nginx as a separate container here for um, reverse proxy. Uh, there's some bugs, and if you want to go into the code and fix some of those bugs and uh, send me a pull request, that would be sweet. Um, but yeah, if you want to play around with React and that React app, you can. Um, there's also like plenty of stuff that you can do with Swagger. Swagger and Jots don't play well together. That is like, you have to do a hack for that to get that to work, um, just that way. Um, resources, so I got the slides, I got the project repo, I got the blog post, I got a couple other resources here if you're in the 12-factor. Um, this is a really good post on uh, playing 12-factor uh, with Docker. I do have a Docker cheat sheet here for all of the uh, Docker commands. Um, I am building out this thing called testscript.io. It's basically this entire presentation, just with Python and Flask, and it goes over all the AWS services that you need to get this into production and orchestration. Um, and then there's a couple other um, blog posts there. So, all right, Whew. a lot of talking. We got through it. Yes, all right, so questions, concerns, feedback. question is, how many nicknames have I given Pete? Um, well, Pete, Pete goes by top left, so <laughs> I guess just one. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Can you tweet those? Yeah. Can you tweet out those resources? And those yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll tweet it and like, I guess just put at develop Denver or whatever it is on there. Are you going to make Pete do anything? <laughs> More Pete questions. They are very interested in our relationship here. <laughs> the question was, am I going to make Pete do stuff? Like push-ups, you mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, what do you guys to say where we had a microservice that was like It's really good, um, especially if you have teams where you have somebody doing, say, a Rails-based microservice and somebody doing a Node-based microservice. But, do you know any ways to help rectify, in the case of deployments, where some microservice is being developed based on a new version of the contract with another microservice, and you can't yet deploy that because the other microservice that it's dependent on is not up to date? Yeah, um, basically the question is around like how do you like version your API, so if you um, or updating your API, like how do you push that to prod without breaking everything else? 
Um, ben kind of talked a little bit about this in his talk when he was like arguing against microservices. Um, this is really difficult. You have to pretty much version control your um, API, so that's why you see like version one and version two. Uh, I can't really think offhand of any other way to do it. Um, if anyone else has any ideas or anyone else has actually tackled that, then. How we handled it, just for a little bit of background, yeah. is we did version our APIs, but we ended up with a deployment window. And so everybody basically had to sign up and do a deployment window at like 11 p.m. on a Friday or something. Yeah. But that obviously hampers um, efforts like continuous deployment and things like that. Yeah, interesting. So like we basically just kind of deprecated the old one within the company and they just had to update. Yeah. yeah, I guess if you you have huge breaking changes, your API that could be bad. <laughs> it, it can be painful. Yeah, I guess if your customers in that point are just like your internal customers, then you don't have to maybe you don't have to worry about it quite as much, but you probably wouldn't want to do that to your external customers. Right. Cool. Good question. Anything else? Yeah. Can you mount volumes with containers using like network drives? So, my, my issue is I, I want to run my local dev server and my local GraphQL server on my home server that's a lot more powerful than my laptop because my laptop is like fan blowing like crazy and it's hot. Um, so, I'd like to have, have that offloaded, but I still want to have it. And so, I guess I could like work on the files that are on the server remotely. There's got to be some sort of remote. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so his question is about how can I create a volume that's like on infrared machine? So you know, when, when I started working at Galvanize, I had a gate, eight gigabytes of RAM, and I like ran out of that super fast just because of like I have a thousand containers or whatever on here, and I move up to 16 gig. But like if you, if you, you definitely will have problems if you, you know, keep containers and images up that you aren't using. If you, but, um, I have to, to mount a volume on a different system and rely on networking there, I don't know. Um, that's a, it's an interesting, interesting problem. Let's, let's what do you think about Mark? We've done that and had some issues where it just disappears if there's a big up over us. Yeah, you almost might need like an orchestration type thing, maybe like Kubernetes might handle that a little bit better. Um, I know like with ECS you can use volumes and they get moved over to like a different container or a different and a different EC2 instance. So I know it can be done uh, on development. I mean you might be able to pull in like Kubernetes and do it. Cool. More questions? All right. So thank you. Uh, a few shout outs. I want to thank uh, my girlfriend Anna, um, Pete. Uh, Develop temper and um, in general, I'm getting a little bit teary eyed here. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, just want to want to thank you know Develop Denver and you know most important you guys like you know I it's it's such a privilege and honor to be up here. But thank you.